Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I think we'll probably still have a few people join as I get started here. So apologize if I have to stop for a minute to let people in. Um, happy New Year, everyone. My name is Catherine Pugh. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Policy here at EHI. Our EHI is, if you guys didn't see at the end of the year, we officially rebranded from uh, e-health initiatives to executives for health innovation. We're pretty excited about that. And we're also excited to be joined today uh, by Steve Posnack, the Deputy National Coordinator at ONC. Um, I was joking earlier, if you missed it, that um, someone, uh, one of our policy steering committee members joked that we had booked Steve for the late night tour on TEFCA. <laughs> late night TV tour of TEF for TEFCA. Um, it was purely coincidental, but great timing um, that if you missed it, uh, the TEFCA and QHIN framework were released earlier uh, today. And I think most of you probably just hopped off a call with ONC um, and Sequoia Project. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time. I will say that quickly that if you've haven't joined one of our monthly policy briefings previously. This is a member benefit that we offer to all EHI members um, where we bring in a guest speaker every month for a quick interactive 30 minute discussion. So um, we will, uh, I will be checking the chat box for questions, but also encourage you all uh, turn on your cameras, um, pipe in as we go throughout the discussion. Um, but I will turn it over to Steve, um, who needs no introduction, has been with ONC for, I think, more than 15 years now, involved in everything from the ISA to USCDI to TEFCA. Um, and Steve is going to go over, I think you have a couple of slides, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, and you are going to just give us a little overview of what ONC is focused on this year. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Catherine. Catherine just named all the, the, the most recent tracks off my recent album. So um, <laughs> the, the top of the charts. Um, great. So uh, as we mentioned, Steve Posnack, great to be with you. Small, intimate gathering. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the acronym change because I was like, I think this is new, but I don't remember when it happened. Um, all right. Two years in the pandemic. Can I share my slides? I can. All right. Awesome. Um, they should be up. Cool. Good. All right. Awesome. So mm -hmm. Um, I did not take a uh, crystal ball picture, but as uh, Catherine and I went through, um, given it's the beginning of the year, wanted to give you a sense of the um, things that are going to happen with relative predictability uh, mm -hmm. in 2022 in terms of ONC activities and uh, other areas where you may all have a role to plug in, provide feedback, um, make sure that your organizations are up to speed in terms of uh, what's happening in the health IT space and interoperability. All right, um, really quickly, I only have about 10 slides, um, and I know many of you know ONC. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, we were formed in 2004, established a statute in 2009 as part of the High Tech Act. The High Tech Act obviously included all of the incentives, if you've caught our earlier call, to uh, stimulate EHR adoption, among many other investments that we made from a health IT infrastructure perspective. And then, you know, fast forward, uh, Congress took another turn to the crank from a legislative perspective, and uh, we received the 21st Century Cures Act implement, and that resulted in new program investments, the uh, new regulations that we've issued related to both changes to our certification program, as well as, uh, you know, we put in air quotes, uh, information blocking, uh, the exceptions and, and uh, motivational factors for exchanging electronic health information. And then as a third bullet noted there, uh, which I will get to in a second, uh, is uh, associated with the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. Um, it couldn't have happened on a better day, coincidentally, right, for me to to, me, to, to come and present. It's almost like us dropping things on the day of at HIMSS. Um, and uh, I'd like to say that was planned, just for my benefit, uh, in coming to speak with you all today. But uh, lots, of, um, lots of runways that we tried to land this plane on, uh, and, and today happened to be the best day to do it. So um, we will keep moving forward. Uh, just in terms of overall, you know, gestalt of what, what ONC works on a day-to-day -day basis, um, what I am uh, continuing to poke and prod the team on generally falls into, into three buckets 
um, are around standard certification and exchange. And so when you look at the various different efforts that ONC is engaged in, uh, it usually falls into one of those three or, you know, a combination of them. In addition to our role as, you know, your national coordinator, uh, which our, our national coordinator, Mickey Trapathy, is, is fond of saying, we are your national coordinator too. Um, and so there's lots of work that we do uh, both with our federal partners to help make government better from a health IT and interoperability perspective, as well as with our, our state and, and uh, public sector colleagues uh, all together. Um, and so largely that's to address these two objectives that we've uh, noted there, um, enhancing the use of health IT and its capabilities, as well as establishing transparent expectations for data sharing. So we, we, go, we go about that in a number of different ways. Uh, I'm going to cover a few of the highlights, as, as was indicated earlier, about um, activities that we've been involved in leading up to this year. And 2022 really uh, is shaping up to be a, a transformative and potentially pivotal year for our industry as a whole. Uh, and hopefully that will sink in more as, as I go through just a few quick slides. So uh, what we're focused on, just to boil down um, you know, activities that we've been involved in, and it's hard to believe what's the 18th and two days, you know, I'll have uh, one year of this administration already. Um, as, as I mentioned, it's um, I'm on my 16th year, fast approaching 17th and counting, um, but, uh, and it goes quick. Um, so, you know, we are still uh, very dedicated and focused behind the scenes on a lot of the, uh, the COVID response, working closely with our colleagues at CDC and many other federal agencies. Um, there's lots of interoperability work, which I'm sure is uh, not something I need to tell you all um, about uh, working in the connections between EHRs and all the other hops in between to get public health uh, reporting to occur, as well as the modernization of the public health infrastructure, which is something that we're working with our CDC colleagues on as well. Um, there's an executive order that the president released uh, that we are uh, implementing uh, and have gotten high tax feedback on the Health IT Advisory Committee uh, so there's a number of things that are, are all uh, swirling in that space. Um, second around this, this area is around open APIs uh, and uh, in, instilling more competition into the ecosystem. Um, I'll talk about the timeline about uh, the 21st Century Cures Act and some of the regulatory requirements that are going to start to kick in this year. And that is the next evolution of our secure standardized API work, uh, largely focused on Fast Healthcare and Interoperability Resources, FIRE. I'll try to use the, the non-acronym version of, of terms first. Um, and then moving on is around health information exchange. We'll talk about TEFTA in a little bit. Uh, then uh, one area that I know is, is certainly a passion of, of ours, as well as many of you on the call through uh, the new EHI, uh, is the establishment of health equity related um, processes. And if you heard Mickey speak, he's talked a little bit about our approach to uh, looking at things from a health equity by design type of, of model and principle for looking across our portfolio of work and saying, you know, is it a standards issue? Is it something that we can help with from an equity perspective? Is it an interoperability issue to make sure uh, that, um, you know, we can change the way in which care is delivered to help facilitate uh, the broadest population possible? Are there other things that we need to consider in terms of how health IT is designed, implemented, and used? And that's really just shining a spotlight, giving us a new way to look at things and uh, thinking about our work, which is really energizing. Uh, lots of our, our staff come from uh, various components of the, the, the health ecosystem and they wind up at ONC because they have a, a passion for, for IT and how it can change uh, you know, things in the world. Uh, so we are working across, um, this is one of the most interesting things for me career-wise, the health and human services domain, which if you recall, uh, we are part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and, and largely, I would say, a lot of our work um, in the prior, you know, decade or dozen years has been really focused on the healthcare side. And so, as we start to think more broadly about uh, equity by design, um, you know, changing the way in which health disparities is considered, social determinants of health, and other factors along those lines, um, working closely with our partners on the human services side of the department is uh, a really important step for us, and uh, just shows the changing nature of the way in, in, in which we adapt and evolve within the department even. Uh, and that's a good segue in terms of the last thing that we work on, which is a continued you know, refresh and renewal on how we partner with our federal agencies and um, other executive branch uh, stakeholders that we have to make sure that they're being successful in their missions with respect to the deployment and use of health IT. In addition to working with them and making sure that you know, 
we have a lot of experts that understand fire. Uh, we have obviously regulated it and have a good sense of what's going on. Um, but there are a lot of other federal agencies, um, and I'm sure, you know, colleagues that you work with that don't do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So we do a lot of in-house kind of consultative expertise and support to our other federal colleagues that don't have uh, a wealth of health IT experts on their teams. Uh, that's a lot of things that we do behind the scenes, plugging in to uh, help cumulatively focus and orient our, our national health IT goals. All right, on to the fun stuff. So um, you may remember when we put out a blog post uh, a while back when uh, Mickey had first started, um, we wanted to um, lay out a timeline for how we were gonna go about operationalizing Kefka. And uh, we are at that point right in the middle here. Uh, you know, the you are here, I just didn't add that to the slide. Um, we actually exceeded our goal of, of uh, getting, getting the Trust Exchange uh, Framework and Common Agreement version one out uh, in the earlier part of Q1 2021. So uh, that gives us a long uh, period of time throughout the rest of the year oh, nice. to work on the uh, implementation, the onboarding, the selection of qualified health information networks. That's what QHIN stands for if you're not uh, fluent in TEFCA ease yet. And uh, you know, our hope, as we've noted, is uh, that by Q4 of this year, there will be uh, you know, live information exchange under the common agreement. If you'd like to catch any of the resources uh, that are made available, um, you can go both to healthit.gov. So we have uh, slash TEFCA there. And then I think if you just go to rce.sequareproject.org, it will take you to the main, main page. Um, lots of information that we've worked on uh, to um, make consuming effectively five years worth of, of work in terms of implementing this section of the Cures Act uh, available to everyone and to catch you up on uh, all of the detail. Now, this is where I get to say, uh, but wait, there's more. Um, just like with any contract, uh, which is what the common agreement is, there uh, is going to be lots of other implementation details that need to get um, finished and buttoned up uh, and uh, loops closed, so to speak, uh, where we have the QN technical framework, which is the, the more technical implementation guidance uh, for those networks that may be interested in becoming uh, QHINs. We also have a number of standard operating procedures that will be um, pushed out uh, over the next several months to uh, fully provide con contractual implementation, um, you know, clarity and resources for stakeholders that may be either operating at the QHIN level, or we have this participant and sub-participant uh, lingo that we use for those that are, um, you know, within or underneath a, a QN specific umbrella. So uh, that's your, your up to the minute update on uh, the trusted exchange framework and common agreement activities. The next I wanted to, to go through is, um, as you may recall from our Cures Act final rule, uh, we introduced the concept of the United States Core Data for Interoperability, USCDI. We went through the first iterative cycle of updating the USCDI to version two. We adopted that as the final version, uh, which um, you've got up here on the screen in July. And we are now starting the process uh, as we do every January, hopefully from now on, uh, to put out a draft of the next version of the USCDI. Uh, so draft V3 will be coming out very shortly um, in terms of uh, identifying an opportunity for public comment and shaping that up until the point where, again, hopefully we're planning on being on a January and July cycle where we put out a draft in January as a result of all the feedback that we've captured in the prior year. Uh, we go through a public comment process, uh, reconcile those comments and feedback, and then ultimately uh, ONC puts out a next version of the USCDI. So um, you've got both January and July to look forward to in terms of USCDI related processes. Uh, that will also feed into something else that we introduced in the Cures Act final rulemaking, which is called the standards version advancement process. And so we often quickly <coughs> acronymize that to FVAP, um, SVAP. And so that, that is um, connected to our certification program processes where we recognize after many years of going through this uh, uh, regulatory cycle that uh, the standards community doesn't stop its work, and you all don't stop your work in terms of making updates and changes to implementation specifications and standards. We really needed a way to allow for the market to proceed ahead uh, and have their work continue to be recognized from a certification program perspective. So the SVAP processes that we've introduced will hopefully allow for uh, new versions of standards and implementation specifications to be uh, approved by the national coordinator for the purposes of the certification program 
and provide a little bit of a, a predictability and, and uh, runway for uh, health IT developers in this case to move to newer versions voluntarily at this stage um, and understanding what would be you know, future requirements uh, as new regulations are considered in the future. The USCDI is part of that process and cycle. Uh, the SVAP cycle that we're currently in is um, set to be finalized uh, this spring uh, in the May-June time period. And so, um, you know, that's another thing for you to be on the lookout for as well. All right. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to call to your attention is not a streaming service, uh, but we do call it USCDI Plus. And uh, one thing that we recognize is that um, with the USCDI, it's the core data for interoperability. It has connection and is embedded within our certification program, um, you know, serves use cases like transition of care and patient access and other provider uh, uses of uh, the Firebase API that we've regulated. And that has a, a, a specific, you know, baseline core focus, but there are many other use cases in specific from our federal partners that with additional consistency and alignment could really help add efficiencies to uh, the market, could help provide new clarity for uh, help IT developers and um, allow for us as a, as a country to coordinate. And, and I like to say curate a lot, you know, curate, a set of data elements that really have an impact. Um, and as we looked at, you know, is the USCDI, you know, the thing to rapidly expand into this, you know, giant set of data, or do we want to keep that focus on, you know, this core set of data that's driven through uh, our, our certification program in support of, of uh, some of the, the key CMS programs? Um, and, you know, what can we do to support our federal partners that have other mission interests that could really benefit from a USCDI type model? And so at this stage, we are actively working on, as uh, we put out a blog post, I probably should have put the link on there, um, you know, with our colleagues in the public health and quality domain, so that's CDC and CMS, on areas where we can collaborate from a USCDI plus perspective to um, work with them to take what they need out of the USCDI, you know, the whole thing portion and pair that with other data, that's the plus, uh, that may be relevant to their particular program activity. All right, uh, on to the date. Um, and I'm starting to talk like a native New Yorker because I want to make sure that we have an abundance of time for you asking questions. Uh, we've got a top half, bottom half. Top half is certification. Bottom half is in, uh, information blocking. Um, on the top half side, uh, we're coming up real close to the uh, April 1st, which is the first attestation period for the conditions of certification. So health IT developers have a number of conditions of certification. Uh, this will be the first time that they will have had to make that attestation uh, relative to their product compliance. The other one that I want to you know, flip back for, for December of uh, 2021 was the first submission of what are called real-world testing plans. So that was another condition of certification that Congress required uh, as part of the 21st Century Cures Act. And each health IT developer needs to make their real world testing plans publicly available on their website. And so if you um, have a little trouble navigating any of the health IT developer sites individually, you can go to what's called our certified health IT product list or chapel and you know, pick that developer and navigate your way on the left side of their product uh, pages. Uh, you can see a, a link for their real world testing plan. So what'll happen is you track across that timeline there um, into March of next year, that's when they have to transparently and publicly report their results relative to those plans. So largely with respect to real world testing, you've got a performance year that the health IT developers are responsible for, and then they publish those results uh, the following year. The important deadlines that I wanted to call your attention to really happen toward the end of 2022. Uh, first on the information blocking side, chronologically, October of 2022 is a big date where we shift from the 18-month uh, period at the beginning of the information blocking applicability date, uh, where just the USCDI version one data was in scope for information blocking. And as you shift into October, that's when, for those of you that are familiar with electronic health information, the other EHI, um, you have uh, uh, a much more expansive set of electronic health information that would be considered um, in scope for the purposes of information blocking, uh, access and exchange and use, as the phrase goes, as well as for potential enforcement actions uh, in that future period as well. At the top part, you've got the uh, rollout requirements and uh, you know, deployment of uh, the new Firebase API capabilities, uh, as well as the USCDI updates. 
Um, all of those are due to be rolled out to customers from health IT developers to which those requirements are applicable uh, by the end of this year as well. And so I often note this last phrase that I've got at the top title of the slide, which is these are comply by dates. And so um, especially for the technology requirements for health IT developers, if they're ready to roll them out to their customers today, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. Um, and, you know, we would certainly encourage them to do that, you know, as soon as they're able to and ready to, to, to manage their rollout. Uh, as opposed to wait until, you know, dropping things uh, right at the end of the year uh, for their customers. Um, so that's a real uh, quick glimpse at what 2022 has in store for you from a uh, Cures Act final rule uh, timeline. Uh, I did want to wrap up in terms of just a few other things to keep on your radar. Uh, so we've got USCDI draft version three, which will be uh, coming out very shortly. Uh, we typically publish as well the reference edition of the Interoperability Standards Advisor. I think we're on the eighth or ninth uh, version of that. So I wanna thank all of you, I'm sure, who have contributed over time to the Interoperability Standards Advisory. Um, we did put out in the administration's, it's called Unified Agenda, which gives you a little bit of a forecast for regulatory work and RFI on prior authorization. Uh, so that's um, in the, the near future of the crystal ball, as well as a proposed rulemaking this year from ONC on updates to the certification program uh, to implement the 21st Century Cures Act as a, a last uh, condition of certification around what's called the EHR reporting program. It's a, some requirements that are applicable to health IT developers. Uh, there is an attestation process for health information networks that the Cures Act required to go through rulemaking. And so all of those bundled together are focused on, you know, heightened information sharing activities. Um, for those of you that have participated in what's called Project USA, uh, we recently, a week or two ago, announced the release of the specification for address uh, information to um, improve patient matching. So we're going to work with the industry to get that into practice uh, this year as well. And then I also wanted to call your attention to the leading edge acceleration project, LEAP in Health IT. Uh, we have two uh, that are um, particularly relevant as Catherine and I went back and forth on some of the, the topics that you all may be interested in, especially with respect to social determinants uh, of health and public health. Uh, we've got one from UT Austin, uh, and you can read that there, but they've got a, a platform that they're working on uh, to focus on closed loop referral for social services. And then a second uh, that's called Cumulus, that's looking at you know, broader population analytic uh, related activities using the bulk fire capability, which is one of those capabilities that we built into the certification process as well. So uh, with that, uh, whirlwind tour, half hour, uh, you know, speed, speed uh, uh, presentation. Um, appreciate your time. Happy to answer any questions, and I will uh, stop the share here. I guess so we can go back to the main main portion. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, that was a great job getting through uh, a lot of work that you guys have on deck for the for the year. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time. I will get to questions. I think you have a, a three thirty hard stop, or are you able to? Yeah. Yeah, so we will we will get to questions. Um, encourage people if you have a question to put it in the chat, or if you want to uh, take yourself off mute and ask directly, you can as well. Greg, I see you have your hand raised. Greg Carey. Yes, thanks, Catherine. Hey, Steve. Um, I, I realize I, I may be asking a, a question uh, you can't answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, one of the goals that you identified for 2022 was aligning federal agencies, health IT activities, you know, across different departments, I think was the, the fifth goal. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Are, are those things that would be aligned with the work you guys are doing under the Cures Act, or are these kind of net new, unique uh, opportunities? Um, yeah, it is, and I'll, I'm happy to share my slides with Catherine, too, in case anyone wants to copy the slides. Um, you know, it, it's, a good, it's a good question. I think it's a mix of both. Um, you know, in some cases, we have um, uh, longstanding relationships with federal partners. Obviously, with, with Mickey coming on board, he has interests where he's, you know, sat in your all seat, uh, you know, attending these meetings and had a viewpoint of what, what he would do differently or better um, if he was in charge. And now he has that opportunity, right? So, um, you know, there are other agencies uh, with whom, you know, we're uh, establishing net new relationships, you know, as well. Um, in terms of implementing some of Secretary Becerra's, you know, uh, interests, um, you know, for the department uh, as a whole. And so in some of those dynamics, we are getting paired up, you know, with other uh, HHS agencies um, to uh, provide some of that consultative support, like I mentioned earlier, 
uh, that we previously didn't do. Um, and that's largely what we're, you know, trying to bring staff expertise to as opposed to, you know, putting out a project or um, other types of, you know, cooperative agreement or grant money out the door. Great. Thanks. That's helpful. I think uh, we have another question from Janice. Karen? Yes. Hi. Um, so on the Tufka front, um, one of the major differences in this Tufka release is mention of a patient access as a major goal which brings CMS and ONC more into alignment in their goals and approach. I haven't had a chance to read much of the new material yet, but can you speak to how patient access is enabled in this final version, particularly since there's no fire support? Yeah, um, and you know, so there's, there's two parts in terms of the uh, common agreement itself um, as the kind of legal contract to establish the exchange purposes. And so what we call individual access services that is that patient access modality. Uh, there will be a um, in an op standard operating procedure that will include more details around its implementation. Uh, that was one of those things where, you know, you have multiple levels in terms of um, establishing the broad parameters for uh, the contract itself, the exchange purposes of which individual access is one of them, and then uh, how that would be accomplished, uh, the security requirements, the identity verification, you know, authenticate um, uh, level of assurance requirements as well. So all of those things, you know, we know need uh, some additional detail to be wrapped around them uh, with respect to enabling uh, individual access. But from a technical perspective, the you know the go live uh, absent fire per se, and we do have a fire roadmap for Tefka. Um, that is, uh, you know, also I would encourage you all to take a look at too, because that will, you know, play into to your question as well. Um, the the query mechanism through the network as it stands today, you know, would be the uh, method by which uh, individual access services would start, um, and that would be uh, how that dynamic would get going. Thank you, Steve. I think we have one more question in the chat from Lee, um, and we actually received this in a in a previous question as well. Um, the unified calendar, and it also wasn't in your presentation, doesn't mention the rule um, required in cures around appropriate disincentives for providers and information blocking. Um, recognizing that's probably on the CMS side, but you guys are working with CMS on this. Uh, can you provide an update on where that rule might be? Yeah. So. Um... Ongoing conversations within the department, um, you know, certainly recognize that that is, um, you know, one of the, there's a three-legged stool, one of, one of the legs of a stool that has multiple legs um, that, that, you know, requires full implementation for the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, obviously, OIG's rule, I believe, is on the unified agenda with a forecast for when they um, would have their enforcement rule out for uh, the health IT developers and networks under the civil monetary penalties. Um, for providers, it's ongoing conversations within the department about the, the mechanisms uh, for establishing disincentives um, and uh, how that would best be implemented uh, relative to, you know, the rulemaking requirements that we know we would need to go through. Um, so that would be one thing to keep an eye out uh, for um, into the future. Um, this year, you know, I would say we expect to make solid progress on that. Um, but, uh, you know, with respect to unified agenda entries, <laughs> Uh, nothing, nothing that was ready at the time that we had to submit that, which is, you know, not to bore you with the bureaucracy and the process, but the, the unified agenda submissions happen like way upstream and they take a little bit longer than you would think to get out the door. Um, mm -hmm. That one's typically called the fall unified agenda. And, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, sometimes it lands in the November, December time period. Um, so that's largely what's up with respect to provider disincentives at this stage. Well, great. I know that we're at 3.30. Um, one last quick question in the chat here. Um, you mentioned the certification proposed rule um, coming out in July. Um, any quick thoughts on scope of that rule? Is it specific to the updates and in the, in the information blocking required rule or information? Yeah, blocking? and I'll, I'll, uh, I, I bought myself like two more minutes from the, the other the other place that I have to go. Um, but it's another outside stakeholder, which I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, yeah. not trying to keep them waiting. If it was my internal team, then I'd happily, you know, <laughs> brush them back for a few more minutes. Um, so, you know, one thing just to peel through the chat real quickly, uh, the fire at scale task force is, as Lee mentioned, um, earlier in the chat, 
Uh, that's one thing that we've been looking to work collaboratively with HL7 to stand up a, a fire accelerator and transition that, you know, formally as it matures and its processes matures. So we definitely encourage you and your organizations to, to keep, keep a lookout for that um, and encourage your participation in that. That's something that ONC is, you know, committed to. Um, and an area where we see future TEFCA fire roadmap work uh, occurring through that fire accelerator, potentially, if, it, if it's a good fit for them. Um, you know, with respect to this next rulemaking, um, you know, it's largely focused on the implementation of the condition of certification for the EHR reporting program. Uh, with respect to the certification, you know, requirements as the title suggests, um, the TEFCA attestation process, as was noted, uh, there's really not too much more detail that I can get into, you know, with respect to the, the content of the rule there. Um, but, uh, you know, we know that there are uh, other areas of the uh, certification program additions um, that may, you know, require updates over time. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, further requests for information uh, within, you know, a proposed rule like we normally do um, and uh, opportunities you know, for uh, you all to comment on other changes that may be, you know, of value for the future. Thanks so much, uh, Steve. This has been a great presentation. We won't take up any more of your time. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of uh, requests for your slides, so I will follow up with you to get a copy of that. Um, but we have recorded this as well, and I'll let you get to the next group you're speaking at or your next uh, engagement on the late, late night uh, tour for TEFCA, late night TV tour for TEFCA. Um, so thanks so much. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time. And um, for all of our members on the call, keep, a, keep an eye out for our February policy briefing. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon.